We are gonna be installing a monster size camshaft into our monster big block Chevy build today. And I know you guys are gonna love how this thing sounds at idle because everyone likes to talk about how a camshaft chops. Well, let me tell you, this one is gonna make some really cool noises. Now the engine that we're working on is a 535 cubic inch big block Chevy that's slated to replace the Gen 7 8.1 that's currently under the hood of the ugly truck. It's got an 80 millimeter turbo on it right now and we're hitting it with about 20 pounds of boost and so far that junkyard motor has not complained one little bit. However, I know it's not going to hold up to the power goals that we have in the long run, which is 1500 horsepower at the wheels. So of course we're building a stronger engine and it is a 535 cubic inch, still 8.1 based. It's a gen seven big block Chevy, but this is constructed entirely out of aftermarket parts from the block to the crank, to the pistons, the heads, the intake, everything that we've built here is stronger than stock and it'll flow better to help us produce all the power that we are after. Now, a little bit later today, we're also going to be doing a few things to the Copo truck. And some of you guys have actually asked me, why don't I put the turbo big block into the all wheel drive Copo truck? Because of course it would make sense, you know, putting down all that power and torque through four wheels and instead of only two with my extended cap. Now that idea actually, it, it kind of does intrigue me a little bit, but the Copo truck, it's already done, it's complete. It's got an LSA supercharged 4.8 under the hood. And to be honest, I've kind of thought about selling that truck just because I don't have any other immediate plans for it. And there's always other projects that we're looking to start. But anyway, today we're talking about our big block. So let's get started. All right, so before I put the cam in, we got to put these oil galley plugs in place because they'll be covered up by the sprocket stuff. And this very first plug actually has a teeny tiny hole in the end, and that is actually going to help lubricate the timing chain. It'll just have a small oil spray kind of shoot out when the engine's running. And while we're at it, there's a couple more ports in the valley that also need to be plugged. Now you want to be careful because if you put a plug with a little hole in it here, well, you would lose all your oil. Now I only set the intake manifold and cylinder heads on the block just because I wanted to get an idea of what it looks like. And that's kind of one of those things like it gets you motivated to get the engine across the finish line. But we pulled them off because obviously they're not ready to be permanently installed. I got all the oil galley plugs installed that I could access. There was a handful on the front, a couple actually in the valley, a few on the back of the block. There's one more plug missing on the side of the block. I just don't have that one yet. Um, but you know, obviously the important ones are the ones that are going to be hidden behind the camshaft sprocket. So we're now ready to get the cam installed and I wanted to do a, just an interesting comparison between the two cams that we have in the Copo truck and the one that we're going to be installing in the big block. Now the specs for the orange truck, it's a 4.8 liter LS and it's a 220 and 224 duration cam at 50,000 lift. With total lift, I think it's like 525 or something like that, where the cam we're installing in the big block, it has a total duration, or uh, sorry, duration at 50 thousandths of uh, 258 and 263. So quite a lot more duration and lift as well. It's got a total lift of just over 700 thousandths of an inch. And on top of all that, it's also a solid roller cam. Now, proportionally, the cam actually isn't all that much bigger. It does sound cool when you're saying the numbers like, yeah, she's got 700 thousandths of lift. Uh, but because the engine is so much bigger, the camshaft effectively becomes a little bit smaller. So 
they're actually probably going to be a very proportional cam. Like I'm not gonna be spinning this engine to 7,000 RPM. It's probably gonna have a ceiling of maybe 62, maybe 6,500, somewhere in there. Um, anyway, the cam, this is a solid roller. The only bad part about it, which actually I don't think I would even consider it a bad part. The only difference is this is a traditional big block Chevy firing order where normally the Gen 7 big blocks use an LS firing order. Um, when we bought the cam, they just didn't have the right cores available and had no idea when they would even be back in. So we got a regular big block Chevy firing order. All we've got to do is swap around the wires for the injectors and for the coils on those few cylinders that are different. And if I ever decide to change it out, well, we just got to move those wires back. Not a big deal. Anyway, we also rounded out the package with a JP Performance double row timing. This is for a Mercruiser 8.1. Um, so it does have the... Uh, cam sensor cutout that we need. So this is a 1X cam sensor, just like a LS uses. Uh, we can also uh, have a few positions to advance and retard the cam. We got a new uh, GM, whatchamacallit, guide plate thing. Uh, Crower Enduramax solid roller lifters. This is a 903 body. I believe it's a little bit larger than what the big block normally uses. So we had to bore these out and hone them or whatever they did. So let's, uh, let's get this cam shaft installed. So the camshaft is in and I was just about to go install the lower sprocket when I realized I actually don't have a woodroof key. So we are hitting the road real quick. We're off to our favorite, or pretty much the only local auto parts store I usually go to, O'Reilly's. So what we're doing now is just degreeing the cam shaft. Basically what that is, we are checking to make sure the cam is lined up where we want. And the first step, basically, we gotta find a true top dead center. All right, so our indicator is zeroed. We know where true top dead center is. I zeroed this at maximum lift on the intake lobe. So now I'm looking for 50 thousandths before max lift, which is right in here. 71. We have to add 50 thousandths after. So we'll continue through. There's peak lift there. And I'm just pushing the lifter down onto the cam. There's 
fifty after. Come on. So easy to go too far. Right there. And at one forty nine and a half. Average. One ten and a quarter. That is our intake center line where this camshaft is installed. All right, so we just got the camshaft degreed, which basically means we measured where it is. But just because we know where it is doesn't mean that's the ideal position. So uh, to better explain that, I have someone who's going to do a better job than I can. Hey, it worked. Hey, everybody. Pat Topolinski. <laughs> so um, I put this big block together, and I just checked the camshaft. Um, we're at 110 degrees intake center line. Now, I know one thing you always told me time and time again was just because the cam card says that's where it could be doesn't mean that's where it should be. Um, so walk me through that real quick. Tell me, for my particular application, where should I put this camshaft? People get hung up on, on the cam card. They say, okay, if it says like, I got to put it in, a, like, if it's a 110, I got to put it in a 106. Yeah, put that thing wherever you want. You, 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 can, you can literally make it go anywhere you want for the power. You want the power to extend up high, you retard the camshaft, you take, you know, you, you will actually be, like if it's a 114, you put it in two or three or four degrees retarded to carry your power longer. All that does is it tips the power curve from low to high. Retarded, the more retarded the cam is, the higher it extends power. The more advanced it is, the more it builds bottom end power. You say your cam's in at 110 degrees, what is the low separation of the cam? I believe it's a 114. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a 114. So your cam is in four degrees advanced. Uh, one, let's just back up. I'm, I'm very impressed that you checked it. We're gonna start with it. <laughs> I, 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 I like that because people think that installing a cam straight up is lining up the dots and going, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. You have to know where your intake center line is if you truly care about how your engine will run and building something for a specific application. So that's gonna push my power band a little bit lower. Well, it, it traps air lower in the cycle, or sooner in the cycle, I shouldn't say lower, sooner in the cycle. So, cylinder pressure trapped earlier in the cycle builds cylinder pressure at lower RPM. One other question I wanted to ask you, um, RPM, you mentioned, yeah, we're not going to turn this a whole lot of RPM. And just doing a little bit of back of the napkin calculations, trying to figure out how to get my eight second quarter mile goal. Uh, trying to figure out gearing and tire size and things like that. Um, I'm like, I'm going to have to turn this thing fairly fast if I want to get where I want to be in the quarter mile. So, could I turn this thing 6,500? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, how big is the stroke on this? 4,500. 4,500 stroke. Well, that's a common stroke and a lot of bracket racing, right? Um, GM 572s, uh, you know, that's a 4500 bore, 4500 stroke, right? And uh, that particular engine, you can regularly turn those 7,000. Most 632s are turning 6500, which has a way higher piston speed, way higher mass on the rotating assembly, and they live forever. What, what really fails on things is you've you got to have your valve train correct. You've got to have correct geometry. you got to have stuff that's, that controls what you're doing. So that means you have to have the right spring. You have to have the right setting. If, 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 if this is a hydraulic roller, correct? This is a solid roller. I, I don't know how, how big is the cam. What are the duration and lift numbers? Oh, so it's a 717 lift, and then it's 258, and then 262 uh, for duration at 50, 000, uh, 263. Right, for 535 inches, that's a that's a decent size cam. This is a stop. You're, you're in business. You know, you, you, you'll also, if that stuff is all correct and you have good rocker arms, you'll have no problems putting this in 6500. Eight seconds. Are we talking like 8.9999999? No, no, no. We're you want you want deep in deep. I want 850. Possibly faster. Eight, 850. Okay. Now. I mean, let's do, some, let's do some math here. How much is the vehicle weigh? Right now, 5,000 pounds. 5,000 pounds? Yeah. Okay, so, in, in, woo, baby. <laughs> Boy, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of working on the numbers on that one. You are going to have to 
to stand on this thing hard. Um, it, you say you have a power goal of 1,500, right? 1,500, yeah. Okay, so at, at, uh, is that, that's probably one atmosphere boost, probably with your... I was kind of thinking... I was kind of figuring like 15 to 20 pounds is what we'd have to push through this. Well, the difference between 15 and 20 there, that's, that's not a linear curve. <laughs> Keep that in mind, right? So uh, um, 20 pounds will do it. At, tw at 20 PSI, that engine will be, that engine will be 1750. So I guess the million dollar question is, knowing what I'm putting together, where I have my cam right now, 110 degrees, that's already four degrees advanced. Is there a better spot I could or should put it? If you wanted to make power higher in the, in the, in the power band, I would basically put the cam in straight up, meaning the intake center line at 114, if you could. It just it takes the power curve and just tips it. If you're not watching LT's channel, make sure you tune into Power Nation Engine Power uh, check us out. Uh, LT used to work there, but now he's a famous YouTube star. So. <laughs> I don't know about that, but definitely, definitely check out Power Nation. Definitely check out Power Nation. Yeah, um, and yeah, no, it's, uh, do, you're doing a great job, and it's fun to watch. So, appreciate that. And if, uh, if I can help you anymore, just uh, you know where to find me. Absolutely. I install aftermarket gauges in just about every single build that I do, especially if it's running forced induction, because I just like to keep an eye on the engine and make sure things are operating in sort of a safe zone. Uh, the three gauges that I put in both of my trucks that I have here, um, one is a fuel pressure gauge that allows me to know if the fuel pump is keeping up. We have a boost pressure gauge that lets me know how much pressure we're putting in the manifold, and of course a wideband air fuel ratio gauge and that pretty much gets used while we're doing the tuning process, you know, getting the VE table dialed in. But after that, I usually don't look at it a whole lot because when you're driving down the road, of course, you're supposed to be focused on the task at hand rather than trying to read some gauges. Now, there's also such a thing as too much of a good thing. And when it comes to packaging three gauges, even a small one like this, it can become a little bit cluttered and you know, the, the mounting pod that I have in the ugly truck, for example, I hate how that looks. It doesn't fit good at all. It rattles and I want to eliminate that completely at some point. But today I'm working on this truck and I want to eliminate one of my gauges because there's just a lot going on there. But I also don't want to lose the functionality of the wideband there, even though I don't necessarily read it the whole all the time. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to install a different wideband O2 sensor controller, and that will allow me to get rid of the gauge, but I'm also going to actually gain more functionality. When it comes to tuning your engine, knowing the exact air fuel ratio is like the most important piece of information that you can have. And we measure that with the oxygen sensor that goes into the exhaust stream of your vehicle. Now, unfortunately, the stock narrowband O2 sensors, all they really do is they're just kind of like a switch. They'll tell you if you're running rich or lean or if you're right at that perfect stoichiometric point. But they don't tell you how far you are going in either direction. Uh, if you're running too lean, for example, under power, you could melt a piston and cause major internal damage. Or if you're running too rich, well, then you're just leaving horsepower on the table. So you really need to know exactly what your air fuel ratio is in real time. But to do that, you need a true wideband O2 sensor. Today, we're going to be installing the Performance Electronics Dual Wideband O2 Kit. And the first thing that is just absolutely awesome about this is we're actually going to be able to measure the air fuel ratio of both sides of the engine with a wideband sensor where right now i just have a single sensor on the driver's side so let's say for example on the lsa fuel rail it's a little bit longer it's a fair path for the fuel to get over to the passenger side let's say if there's a little drop in pressure over on the far side of the engine the right bank could be a little bit leaner well we'd have no way to tell unless we have two widebands in there so now that's exactly what we're going to be able to do now, um, you'll notice that there is no gauge with this, and that's because instead of a gauge physically mounted in your truck, there's an app that you can put on your smartphone to measure your air fuel ratio. And it kind of has a little mini data logger built in here, which is awesome. You can read in units of AFR, you can read in units of Lambda, you know, you can go in and change the scale depending on what fuel you have, whether it's, you know, methanol, ethanol in different varieties or just plain gasoline. Um, so that's kind of the app in a nutshell, and I'll show you that more when we get everything hooked up. 
But basically the kit comes with the two controllers. It comes with two bungs that you can choose to weld into your exhaust. It has two Bosch LSU 4.9 widebands. Um, and then I also grabbed these optional extensions just because where the bungs are presently in my exhaust, uh, they're a bit further back. Now, luckily I already have the bungs in there because when I was redoing my exhaust for like the zillionth time this spring, I was like, I better add some extra bungs in here just to be safe. So uh, install is going to be super simple. We don't have to drill any holes in the firewall. We don't have to run any wiring or mount anything inside the dash, um, which is perfect if you've got an older car or truck. Um, there's just two wires really. I'm going to hook up three, but the two wires that you need to get this thing up and running, uh, switched power and a ground. The third wire is a zero to five volt output for a data logger. Like I have mine when I tune, I have it connected into the side of my little uh, HP tuners brick right there. And so right now, of course, the wire goes into this little plug. I've showed you guys that before, but anyhow, um, yeah, super simple installation. And the great thing about having the display on your phone is well, for me, I can get rid of one of those extra gauges if I don't want it there. And like, let's say you're tuning an old carbureted vehicle or something like that. You want to know exactly what the air fuel ratio is. You can be under the hood making your tweaks, doing whatever carburetors do. Um, and you'll know in real time what's going on rather than having to, you know, run into the cab and check and then run back and make another adjustment and have a helper or whatever. Obviously, I don't mess with carburetors, but um, this is a very useful uh, tool or a gauge or whatever you want to call it. It's very useful for a carbureted vehicle. Uh, also has CAN bus capability if you choose to go that route. But like I said, super simple install. So let's get started. Performance Electronics is a made in the USA company based in Ohio, and since 1999, they've been building custom designed electronic solutions for all industries across the globe, but their primary concentration is in the automotive aftermarket. In addition to the wideband controllers that we're installing, they offer standalone engine ECUs, sensors and control modules, digital displays, along with wiring harnesses and connectors, which together can run just about any fuel injected engine in a standalone operation. With their custom designed solutions, Performance Electronics can put your electronic ideas into motion and build you pretty much whatever electronic system you need. Or if you have an existing electronic device that you want hooked up to Bluetooth or an app, Performance Electronics has you covered there as well, whether you need a couple hundred units or tens of thousands. Like I said earlier, installation for the dual wideband kit from Performance Electronics was super simple, especially considering I already had two bungs welded in the exhaust. And yeah, they were behind the catalytic converters, which is going to skew the readings just a little bit. But that's okay because next time I have the exhaust off this truck, which you guys know the exhaust will come off time and time again, I'll just have to drill and TIG weld a few new bungs up front. Uh, in terms of the rest of the setup though, very simple. I have the two modules mounted right there behind the battery. And I am gonna build a little bit of a bracket at some point to kind of tuck those just behind. Uh, the wiring runs across the back of the engine and we just tied into the fuse block. And once we get all that taken care of, it's a super simple setup with the app. 
And then we have a dual channel wideband basically reporting into a single gauge on my phone. So if I want, I can get rid of that gauge on the dashboard. So a really, really cool setup. Um, the other cool thing is they also have a single version, like let's say you have just a single exhaust on your car or truck, or you have an inline four, inline six engine, whatever the case may be. Um, they have the same exact kit with only one sensor, but whichever one you choose, the dual sensor or single, if you use the code Tolman5 as you check out, you'll get 5% off. Um, and I will include a link down in the description below this video. So check out Performance Electronics if you want a really cool wideband setup for your car, truck, boat, power sports, whatever. You can install this on pretty much anything that has 12 volts and an engine. That's also important. You cannot install it on your Tesla. So that pretty much wraps up the short block build for our 1500 horsepower Silverado. Um, we definitely took a different route than usual going with a big block. And the only thing I may do from here on out is I might retard the cam a couple of degrees just to kind of help this thing breathe better in high RPM, kind of like what Pat suggested. If I can get this thing up to like 65 to 6,800 RPM, depending on my tire size and gearing, we can probably get this truck to do like 160 to 70 in the quarter, which I know that's a huge goal and it's gonna take a long time to get there. But that is my objective. Anyhow, if you enjoyed today's video, check out another one where we put the short block together. Um, we always do cool truck stuff here, so come back soon. We have some really cool stuff coming up next week.